G'day guys, today I'll be building a baby cot for my niece's baby doll. So it's going to be a small version of a baby cot. There's the timber that I'm going to be using, it's Tasmanian oak. And there's the plans up on my whiteboard, that's how I'm going to build it. So first up I just want to machine up a little bit of Tasmanian oak to glue up the 40 by 40 legs because I don't have stock thick enough to make it out of a one piece. So I'll rip this one board into three pieces, turn each of those three pieces on edge and glue it together to give me a 90 by 45 mil block of timber roughly. Then I'll rip that in half giving me two blocks 45 by 45 which then I can machine down to create my 40 by 40 legs. And I like to leave glue overnight to dry so while that's drying I'll go ahead and machine up all of the square stock material that I'll be needing for this project such as the bottom slats, the side slats, the top rails and the bottom rails because that's all square stock I can do that now and I'll come back tomorrow when the glue is dry and start on the legs. Now it's the next morning and the timber that I glued up to use for the legs is now well and truly dry so I can rip it in half, machine it down to 40 by 40 and then dock four legs at 330 millimeters each. And it's always a good idea to make sure that those edges are actually square by jointing it using a square fence. And then I mark the locations for the mortises aiming to get the top rails 20mm from the top of the legs and the bottom rails 70mm up from the bottom of the legs. To cut the mortises I'll be using my router with a quarter inch upcut spiral bit in it set to cut about 20 millimeters deep it doesn't really matter how deep it is 20 mil 21 mil it doesn't really matter but i do want to get it dead center of the width of the legs so that it's 20 millimeters either side it's not overly critical but it does make everything a lot easier you'll find that since you're routing right near the end of the legs the router has a tendency to tip over that's why i've got another leg backed up behind it to stop the router from tipping over. Rail, 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 rail. Peace, peace. Now that the legs have been mortised, I can start working on the rails. The front and rear rails are 540 millimeters long, which includes two tenons on each end at 20 millimeters long, leaving the end shoulder distance between the legs to be 500 millimeters. On the side rails, they are 370 millimeters long, minus the two 20 millimeter tenons, it's going to end up being 330 millimeters between the legs. To put the tenons on the end of these rails I'm going to use my standard method using the panel saw, a flat top grind ripping blade and I'm simply going to hog away the waste, leaving behind a properly thickness tenon. Now we don't want the tenon to be too tight and we definitely don't want it to be too loose. So when I do this, since I'm aiming for a quarter inch thick tenon to match my quarter inch thick mortise, I aim for about 6.4 millimeters, which is pretty good. I found that works pretty good if I just measure with a vernier caliper. Now as far as putting the tenon on the curved rails go, if you were to cut the curves out first and then try to put the tenon on there, 
you made your life very, very difficult. So what I've done is I've just started with a much wider board and put a tenon on the end of that wider board. And from there, I can simply cut the curves out and the tenon will be there ready to go and all of those shoulders will be square and plumb and exactly what I need them to be. So now we've got the mortises cut into these legs and the tenons cut onto the ends of these rails. So now I want to shape these upper rails with the minus 20 millimeter bulge in the curve. This will curve down and the ones on the ends will curve up. So it swoops down and then up and down and then up. And that 20 millimeter figure, that's just a figure. You can do whatever you want. I've just got 20 millimeters because it's a nice round figure, but I'm going to do whatever I can do easily. And what I can do easily is I've got this piece of timber that has the tenons cut on either side. I want to put these curves through there. I've got a template from the past. I can simply put this on here and the distance, if I put that onto the bottom and the bottom, the distance from here to here is actually about 20 millimeters on this one. But on the longer ones, these are the front and rear rails, which is going to swoop down the other way. I've got to use a different template because it's a different curve and I've got some marks. So I've measured down 20 millimeters here and 20 millimeters down here. So that should have come all the way up to the top, but you can see that it's about five millimeters short, which means this curve needs to become a little bit more aggressive. I'm not too worried about that. This curve will be 20 mil, this one will be about 15 mil, and it'll look good enough. So I got really lucky on the shorter side rails because the template that I've used to create the arc was actually 30 millimeters wide, but the longer front and rear rails wasn't 30 millimeters. So I've had to cut the first curve and then offset that line using a marking gauge set to 30 millimeters, and then I can cut the second curve. Once I've created the first component, I can use that first component to mark out the second component. It makes it pretty easy from there. And then we give those curves just a quick sand just to make sure that the faces are nice and smooth and consistent and clean and properly curved. And then I just want to clear away some material top and bottom of that tenon to put a shoulder on the top and bottom of the tenon just so that everything's got a nice neat consistent reference point so that it all assembles at the same position up and down. And there's one last thing I need to do because I've got a tenon coming through here and then there's another tenon coming through here you can see that they actually crash so I need I need to put a 45 degree on the end of each tenon on that internal corner so I have to shave that corner off here just roughly it doesn't have to be anything accurate but I do have to get rid of that material otherwise they crash into each other a little bevel on the other side so after a quick dry assembly, we can see that the mortise and tenon work that we've just done has worked, it's all successful. So now I just want to mark each of the faces that require a trench or a groove or a dado or whatever the hell you call them these days to accept the slats for the side panels, the end panels and the bottom slats. Because I'm not going to mortise and tenon it together, I'm just going to put everything into a groove and then fill in the gaps between those slats later on. Using the material that I prepared earlier for the slats, I'm just going to cut these at a rough length, approximately 40 millimeters too long, because I don't know the length of these at this point in time, because all of these slats need to be cut to match the curve later on, so I have no idea what the length is. But to position these into the bottom rail, I'm just going to put a short little stumpy tenon on the end of this, and in just a moment, I'll cut a groove along the bottom rails to accept these tenons.
I'll also run a groove along the inside face of the front and rear longer rails to accept the bottom slats. Now when I machine those bottom slats, I machine them to be 12 millimeters thick. But as I'm moving along through the project, I'm finding that there's just more and more weight being added to the project. So I want to reduce the weight as much as possible. So instead of making it 12 millimeters wide on those grooves, I've just made it about 10 millimeters. And I'll just go back to the thicknesser and remove X amount of material to make sure that those bottom slats do fit into those grooves. I just want to reduce as much weight as possible because it is for a little kid. I had originally planned to put slats all the way around this, but I found this thin board of blackwood full of defects. And if I'm pretty careful, I can dodge most of these defects. So I'm going to put these on the end panel just to give it a bit of flair and jazz and make it look good. So I'm just going to dock them to a rough length because once again, I need to dock the curves into it. And I don't know what length that will be. And then in order to mount these into the bottom rails on the sides, I'm just going to put another little stub tenon on the bottom of this. And the primary reason for this is so that when I sand these panels later on, I'm not going to reduce the thickness of the joinery itself so it doesn't become loose later on. To mount the slats and the panels into the upper rails, I'm just going to put this directly into a groove. There's not going to be a shoulder or a tenon or anything fancy like that. Once I sand these slats and panels down a little bit, it will become a little bit loose. It doesn't really matter because it's on the underside of a rail. You don't actually see it. And with a little bit of glue in there, it will hold firm. It's just not going to be the neatest joint ever. But like I said, you can't really see it unless you go looking for it because it's up underneath something. While I'm over at the router table, I may as well set it up and put a round over on each of the sharp edges because nobody likes sharp edges, nobody likes splinters, and certainly nobody likes scraping their knuckles off on these sharp square edges that these timbers have right now. So I've got a 1 8 inch round over on most of the parts, but on the top surface of the rails, I've gone through and put a larger radius on there, and I think it was about 3 8 so it's either 3 8 or half inch. I forgot how big that router bit is, but it's about three eights I think some of the timbers that I've used here have a fair few defects through it so I'm filling it with some automotive filler also known as bog now it's a two-part mix and it generally comes out a pink color but if you mix it with a bit of brick oxide whatever color you like in this case it's black it it works pretty well it's better than timber filler because the timber filler generally falls out, especially if you're right on the corner of a piece. And epoxy takes a very long time to dry, whereas this stuff dries in about 20 minutes. You can sand it, you can shape it. It just works out pretty well. It does not accept stain very well, but in this case it just doesn't matter because I'm just going to put a clear hard wax oil on this at the end. So it's all good there. So when I put each of these slats into this groove here, it's going to leave a gap here and here, right? So I've gone ahead and machined up some filler mold and I want this filler mold to be exactly flush. And obviously I don't want to put it high and then sand in between these slats later. So what I want to do is I want to take these out, put the long length of filler mold in here now and as you can see, it's sitting high there now. I'm going to plane that perfectly flush. And then if I'm going to have a slat there, for example, I'll cut away that timber and that timber, put the slat in there. Same again here, 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 and here. And that way, even if when I plane this down, I make it slightly thinner here than there, which would mean that the filler mold is thinner here than over there. If I was simply to put 
that piece of filler mold back into this position and that piece of filler mold into that position. It should be fairly flush at the end. So now I need to figure out how long these filler moulds actually need to be. Basically I've got a rail which is X amount long plus a panel which is X amount long which creates two spaces. Those two spaces equally distance is 45 millimetres on the ends and on these longer rails I've got six slats 30 millimetres wide so that's 180 millimetres and that's consuming space from a 500 millimetre opening leaving 320 millimetres worth of space to be filled up by empty space. So 320 millimetres divided by the seven gaps equals 45.7 millimetres or thereabouts. Close enough. I want to glue in the centerpiece first because that way I can use that as a reference to locate the rest of the slats later on otherwise I'm flying blind. I didn't really know how to finish off the top of the legs. I had all sorts of different ideas but they all seemed too hard, too time consuming, too ugly so I've just gone for a pyramid top at 36.9 degrees, just some random number that brought it down 15 millimeters from the top. And I'm not overly happy with it, I'm not unhappy with it, but I think it does work overall, but it does, it does seem like it was the lazy way out. <laughs> it is what it is, I'm, I'm not unhappy about it though, but I probably could have done something a little bit more stylish. Now I'm just squaring up the grooves on the underside of the top rails because I've used that router bit which is about 50 millimeters in diameter so it's scooped in and scooped out so I just have to square up the ends with a chisel and, and I'm doing a pretty rough job to be honest but it doesn't really matter because you can't see it and even in the finished piece it was pretty rough but it is what it is but now I can measure these rails to be 10 millimeters above where they're going to finish and then I can mark a line on each of those slats and the end panels and that'll tell me where to cut it knowing that I'll end up having 10 millimeters of the slats or the end panels up inside that groove and that groove is about half inch deep or 12 millimeters deep so there'll be a two millimeter gap above the end panels or slats so it's a fairly rough measurement it doesn't really matter because it all gets covered up plenty of clearance to be had what you don't want is those slats or those end panels to be too high or too long, whichever way you want to look at it. And it prevents the top rails from actually coming down where they need to be. So off camera, I've gone ahead and sanded all of these components. So they right now they're actually ready for finish. So if I do a really neat and clean job gluing this thing up, tomorrow morning when it's all dry, I can actually just put the finish on there. I don't have to worry about having the sand inside nooks and crannies and making my life a royal misery. But because there are so many components to this assembly, it's best to break it down into sub-assemblies wherever you possibly can. So here I have the front bottom rail along with a series of slats and filler mold. And now if I get all of that glued together as one sub-assembly, that's a hell of a lot of work during the main glue up that I'm not going to have to worry about.
So the big glue up is pretty self-explanatory. There's nothing overly critical about it, except it's very, very easy to forget about putting the bottom slats in there because they're on the bench there somewhere, but if you forget to put them in there, they're kind of hard to get them in there after it's glued together. So make sure you get them in there. We've got a couple of grooves in the side of the front and rear longer rails. They accept the bottom slats. You got to make sure you get them in there. I actually was telling myself all the way through this, the bottom slats, the bottom slats, the bottom slats, the bottom slats, because it would have been a pain in the butt to try to get them in there afterwards. And there they are right there. I didn't forget. All good, eh? Whew. Now, if you've done a really good job on your mortars and tenon joinery and you've made it nice and tight or at least very snug, you won't actually need clamps. Now, I'm using a clamp here and there throughout this glue up just to hold things together while I'm knocking things around. But at the end of it, I don't actually use the clamps at all because the joinery is tight enough that you don't actually have to force a mortise and tenon joint together because the shoulder comes up to the leg and that's as far as it goes. It doesn't go any further. So you can put it 10,000 pounds of clamping pressure on it and you're not actually achieving anything. This was a bit of curved filler mold that I've made to go into the underside of the front and rear rails. Now because it's curved I can't just dock it nice and easily on the saw at 45.71 millimeters apart. I actually need to mark where those slats are and I'll cut it on the bandsaw fairly rough but it, if you do a good job of it you'll be pretty accurate anyway and it gets me close enough and it doesn't really matter if it's perfectly like, it's a kid's doll cot bed thing so if it's slightly off if those slats are not quite plumb it just doesn't matter a little bit of glue and that'll hold those slats in there nice and tight it will stop them from moving left and right with a heavy knock it also fills in those gaps nice and cleanly And so with the glue up successfully completed with no major dramas or incidents, we can throw some finish over this. In this case, we're going to use Evolution Gloss Hard Wax Oil. Now those that know me well enough know that I'm not the biggest fan of hard wax oils as a general rule. I really hate applying it. It goes sticky pretty quickly. And the way that I apply it is I simply put it on there and a few minutes later I'll come back with a clean cloth and wipe it off, wipe off the excess and try to buff it in. And it gets really sticky and I don't like that. But when dealing with kids, because kids are little monsters, they destroy everything they touch, the oil and wax won't actually damage when the kids ding and dent this thing. So unlike a lacquer or a polyurethane, when it gets dinged or dented, it creates a weak spot which might crack and craze and do all sorts of bad stuff. But with this stuff, it just doesn't matter so much. So I think it's a pretty good option for kids' furniture or toys. Anywho, that's all done. Now the pillow is actually just a bit of 50mm foam with a pink unicorn pillowcase from my own personal collection of course. And that's it there, it's all done. This was a gift for my little niece Ella for her fourth birthday. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.